Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Prayer Tuesday. We are happy to re-welcome Jacqueline LaFaro from Otis Elevator. One of the beautiful, thing, one of the beautiful things about doing these Virtual Career Tuesdays is that we can have employers join us for multiple times with a little bit of a different focus for each one of the sessions. Um, today, what we're going to be focusing on is Jacqueline will tell us a little bit about herself and Otis, but then we're going to jump right into the interview process and really giving some detail and some explanation around how does a candidate show their best self in an interview? How do they answer some of the more unique questions? And then we'll go from there. So Jacqueline, would you like to say hello? Yes, thank you all for joining today. Thank you for having me. I'm Jacqueline. Um, I am the early career program manager at Otis Elevator. And so basically I manage the internship program, university relations, and pretty much everything that goes into that. Um, I am a UConn alum myself, so I am proud and excited to be here speaking with you all today. Um, and yeah, I mean, Otis Elevator, for those of you who aren't from familiar, just in a quick nutshell, we are the world's oldest and largest elevator company in the entire world. Um, and so basically for everything from manufacturing, installing, selling, maintenance, repair, et cetera, pretty much anything you can think of um, around, you know, that would be needed for an elevator, escalator, the moving walkways you see at the airport, pretty much, you know, soup to nuts um, for, you know, the elevator industry. Um, we are a 70,000 person company, global organization. Um, so tons of opportunities to, you know, kind of grow and shape your career. And so I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. And one of the things that we were talking about before we started recording is that right now Jacqueline is at Arizona <laughs> University, I believe? Arizona State, I am. I'm in a hotel in Arizona State University. We have a career fair here tomorrow. Right, and we were talking on the video because this is a WebEx recording. So when you first log on, you're doing a video interview with an employer. We wanna try to, to have you test out some of the different applications because Jacqueline doesn't have the access on her system right now to blur the background and change the background. If this was an interview, she would be trying to do that before we get started. So that's part of the, the great part about us being able to do these events and show students different ways that you, you have to show up for an interview. And sometimes it's, you own the fact I'm in a hotel, I can't change my background, but here I am. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I know. Now, these days I do meetings from airports and train stations. I don't recommend doing interviews from there if you can avoid it. But, you know, right. you, you may have interviewers that are all different types of places and their backgrounds may look very strange or noise in the background. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of part of the territory these days. Right. And Jacqueline, I, I understand that the first part of the application process is um, the applicants need to do an on-demand hire view. Yes, some of our roles do. So, you know, we have so many different opportunities at Otis across the U.S. and every manager, every team handles it a little bit differently. Um, the hire view, so it basically what that entails, if you're not familiar with it, basically you get prompted with different questions and you record yourself with nobody else there, right? So it's pre, you know, recorded questions. And then once you submit, somebody watches them, they give you an evaluation, and then they decide on next steps. So not all of our teams utilize that, but many do. Right. And so you have to be able to articulate your story to somebody that isn't responding to you, right? So that that's certainly one of the challenges. And there are many applications out there for the students and candidates that are watching this is practice, practice, practice before you do um, any type of recorded interview. And we've all had the blunder, right? I mean, we've all had that moment where it's on a recorded interview, you can't do anything to change it. And you say the wrong word, the wrong name, you start to panic and just own it. You know, it's okay to say, oh, that might not have been the answer I was looking for. And then just keep going because you really can't stop in the middle of the recorded interviews. Exactly. And some of the platforms, so higher view, for instance, me as the, the person who's setting it up, I can decide if they can re-record their answers or not. 
I personally normally will allow people to do it. So I always get that, but the, you know, whoever is setting it up could choose for you to have one shot and that's it. So you, you kind of have to be prepared for everything. And also mm -hmm. you can't ask clarifying questions, right? When I'm face to face with someone, if they ask me a question and I need a little bit of clarification, I can say, you know, can you explain that a little bit further? Whereas, you know, you can't do that in these pre-recorded type of videos. So you kind of have Absolutely. to be, you know, just prepared and, and calm and answer the questions to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, if you feel like you need a clarifying question, just state how you're going to proceed. You know, you can state, I'm not sure where that's going. So I'm going to make the assumption that what you're looking for is you want me to describe a typical day. And then on the recorded one, you just go ahead because the person watching it gets it, right? They know, oh, that's what they were trying to answer. That makes sense for when you have exactly. that good question. Exactly. How long have you been doing this type of interviewing? Like personally, Jacqueline? Do you specifically the higher views. So yeah. this is the only company that I've personally ever worked for that has utilized them to this capacity. Um, mm -hmm. So just in the last three years since I started at Otis, um, I don't think any other company I've personally worked for had you at least utilized them when I was there. Right. And do you find one of the biggest challenges is for candidates to really understand Otis? To know what, what Otis is actually representative of, what they're doing? Yeah, I, I think sometimes, you know, I think we do really well with those that are in technical majors. You know, when people think elevators, they think mechanics, they think like the electrical components. So a lot of more technical people know who Otis is already. It's really on that other side, right? The business students, the liberal arts students that, right. and me, myself included, I mean, I was a part of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at UConn, and I'd never given any thought to who made my elevators before I was, the day before I was interviewing with Otis, right? I applied on LinkedIn. I probably still didn't know who they were until I got the call to, you know, do the first interview. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I think. It's not it's not complex once you start explaining to anybody right not just students but even you know you know senior level people that just don't know anything about elevators what we do it all makes sense but up front yeah I think that it it takes a little bit for people to understand exactly what it is about elevators that we do and the answer is everything right but yeah. a lot of people it's just not intuitive um, for them to know that I think Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense. And one of the questions, so our university uses Handshake, right? So all of the students watching this will understand that Handshake is a platform that the employers use. Otis has many jobs listed in there right now. And right now it's October 18th, but many jobs in there. Students from around the country at any university can put in a comment. They can say what the interview process was like, and that's a wonderful way to prep for an interview for a company. So I'm going to just go through a couple of the questions that other people that have interviewed for roles say that they've been asked. And I think this one's really unique. And Jacqueline, hopefully it won't like put you on the spot for this question, because I've never heard this question before. All right, hit me. The question is, how would you approach a person you have never met before and need to work with? So that's the question that was asked for the candidate. What do you think they should do with that? So I'm going to ask you a clarifying question. Is, is this when you're first meeting them, you know, pre-interview or is this after you've gotten the job and you're meeting someone that you're going to work with for the first time? I think that's an excellent question. Let's go with the assumption it's somebody that you've met with to work for the first time. So when you start your first day on the job, somebody you've never met before. Yeah, I mean, if I'm pretending it's my first day, right? I mean, I would show my excitement to be there. I think a lot of um, a lot of candidates, even when throughout the interview process, that people really miss is showing your excitement, showing your eagerness to be there, right? I mean, I think that that goes such a long way um, in showing others that you're excited about this new job, whether it's before you get the job or when you're first starting it. Um, and I think that that really goes a long way and people then are excited to get to know you and, and, you know, I think ask people questions again, 
during the interview process or when you're just meeting them, people love to talk about themselves, even if they claim they don't, or at least they love to talk about things that make them excited. So you're going to assume if I work at Otis, I probably, hopefully like working there. Um, and so, you know, ask me about what I love about working at Otis. How long have I been working at the company? You know, what does my team do if it's not the same team um, that mm -hmm. you're going to be starting to work in? Because people get then excited to talk about things that they're passionate about. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. And so for different roles, right? So different roles that are being hired for, there's different skill sets that you're looking for. But can you give us just like an example of two skills that are kind of across the board that Otis finds great value in for candidates? Yeah, and again, I think, again, if it's an engineering position going to be very different than a sales position right so right. you know more on the business side a lot of the opportunities that we have available are in sales marketing um and then finance as well mm -hmm. and so you know technical skills are going to differ right so obviously if you're applying for finance they're going to want you to have strong excel skills if you're applying for a sales position maybe they want you to have strong negotiation skills so those are going to be different across the board but i think more soft skills wise again i i think otis is a very people oriented company we are very very big on the type of people that get hired and the type of people that we work with more so than the technical skills. And you will hear, you know, hopefully you work at Otis, you become a manager one day, you're recruiting for positions. You will hear time and time again, oh, I can teach those technical skills, but I can't teach their motivation or their excitement about the company or the industry. So I think, especially when you're interviewing, make bring that to the table make sure and again similar to my last answer right make sure you are conveying your excitement about whatever it is whether it's finance and they're talking to you about spreadsheets even if you hate spreadsheets like you you've got to sell to the interviewer that you love spreadsheets <laughs> and if it's sales you know you've got to sell to them that you love talking to customers hopefully you do right hopefully that's really genuine but I think it's really a matter of getting getting those things across during the interview. Because again, time and time again, a manager will come to me, I'll say, how did your four interviews go? And they'll say, yeah, this person had really good technical skills, but they, I felt like they didn't wanna be at the interview. I felt like they didn't, they were just checking a box. They didn't, they just wanted a job and not this job. And then you might have on the flip side, well, they didn't really have great technical skills, but they were motivated, they were eager, they asked me questions and they really mm -hmm. seem like they want the job so I can teach all the other things. So I think that a lot of companies really, really appreciate that. And, you know, sp particularly Otis being such a people oriented company, I think mm -hmm. even more so that that's really important. Okay, that's excellent. And then we did have a question. So, um, and this goes back to one of the, the previous sessions that we did. Um, Saif, do you want to just ask the question or do you want me to read it? Uh, sure, I'll ask. <clears throat> so I, I remember, like again, we, we've met before. Uh, and you guys explained that the roles are client facing. So I just wanted to ask um, how those interactions go about, especially with sales and uh, the interactions being business to business. Like, how do you guys kind of like initiate those um, interactions? Do they come to you or do you guys go to them or are there like marketing efforts being made within the business itself? little bit of everything, honestly. So, you know, you were asking specifically about our sales professionals. And so we have six different types of sales professionals, depending on what line of business you work in. So just as a quick example, you can either be selling new elevators. So if there's a brand new building going up in Hartford, they need an elevator. Of course, you might be a sales rep that ha that does that selling. Or once they have an elevator and they need a service a maintenance contract, you might be an account manager, part of our sales team as well, that kind of maintains those customer relationships. So, you know, to answer your question, it's really a little bit of everything. I would say that, you know, some of our sales reps have to be a little bit more of that hunter mentality, so to speak, where they have to, you know, go out there and kind of pitch Otis as, you know, the elevator company of choice. And then there's definitely other types of sales that ha has that more like farmer mentality where they're kind of coming to you and you're kind of just nurturing existing relationships as opposed to going out there and trying to get new sales. So 
it's really a little bit of everything I would say, depending on, you know, where you fall in the, you know, sales spectrum of how we operate and do business. Does so that does that mean, yeah, it does. But does that mean um, you guys are fighting for contracts and how is that kind of like gone, like gone about? Yeah. I mean, I'm not in sales prof personally, so I'm not sure what those day to day look like, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could say we're trying to get a maintenance contract for an elevator in Hartford. We put our bid in, we put our proposal in and our, one of our competitors could do the exact same. Right. Um, and then, you know, just in my understanding that whoever that company is can come back to us and say, okay, your competitor Kone, which is one of our real competitors, they quoted us, you know, X amount of dollars less. Why would we go with you? And then it's really the responsibility of the sales professional to explain to this company why we're more expensive, right? And, you know, for my, you know, what I know, our products are better quality. We have quicker turnaround times for mechanics. Mm -hmm. So if someone is stuck in an elevator, Otis is gonna get to them much more quickly than our competitors, um, our products, our technology. So, you know, we often are more expensive than our competitors. We are typically more expensive, but there's a reason for that. And so as a sales professional, you know, that is something that they have to be ready to answer. Why are you more expensive? Or why would I go with you over a, you know, cheaper option or whatever it is? But all of you know, you all know, right? You can go and buy a toaster for ten dollars, or you can buy a hundred dollar toaster. And you know what happens to that ten dollar one? It breaks, and you have to keep replacing it over and over and over again. And so, you know, our thing is, yes, you may pay up more up front, but our products are going to last longer. You're going to have better customer service, better quality of products. So in the long term, you're going to pay much less. Jacqueline, you just gave the perfect Thank example. You. <laughs> Thanks, Saeed. You just gave the perfect example of somebody who's passionate, right? So if we want a representation, what does it look like when somebody's interviewing and they're actually passionate about the company and, and the job? You just did that, right? It, you, you're not a salesperson, as you said, but you explained the company in a way that made it real and made it, you know, made us care, be vested in the conversation. So thank you for that one. Well, let me just ask you this question. When you do your interviews, what's the first question that you ask? Oh, I mean, but beyond just like, tell me about yourself. I mean, why do you want to work at Otis? I mean, it's such a simple question, but you get so much out of just that very simple question. Why do you work, want to work at Otis? And going back to what I said before about really being able to assess if someone is just wanting a job or wanting this particular job, um, their answer will be very, very telling. And the way that they describe their answer, you know, nine times out of 10, I just made that statistic up, but I'll say nine times out of 10, I can assess very, very quickly if this is someone that really wants this job um, as opposed to, you know, just wanting any job or needing a job or whatever it is. So it's pretty basic. But again, I think that if you come in prepared to answer, you know, just those simple questions, right? And you don't need to know a ton about the company that you're interviewing with. It doesn't require hours and hours of research, but just have a, a couple of little tidbits written down in your notebook that you bring with you, what, whatever it is, just a couple of facts about the company that you can just kind of throw in there when you're answering your questions. To me as an interviewer, I'm thinking, even if it's not, um, consciously, it's even just subconsciously, okay, they've done their homework. Okay. They're, they, they know that about us. And so again, it, it goes a long way, you know, just kind of like sprinkling in different things that you know about the company, because I'll be honest, I have interviewed thousands of people probably in my 16 years out of UConn being a recruiter that they don't know anything about the company that they're interviewing with. They couldn't tell you one thing about the company. And those types of things stand out to interviewers when you have three others that are passionate and know about the company and, and all of those things. So again, right. I think it's just, you know, something to, to always keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that idea of when we say don't go into an interview cold, that's exactly what we mean. It's, it's really obvious to, to recruiters and to, to really anybody who's doing kind of the prep work. If this is an interview, you're just kind of going through the motions. Or if you really do, even if it's not your favorite 
company to begin with in the interview, I think, you know, you and I can agree that it's so different. Like it's, you can't really fake an interview. Yeah. You can't really fake that idea of, I'm just doing this interview to just see if I can get any job that out there. You, you can't be effective in the interview if that's, if that's the thought process that's going on in your head. So yeah, that, that practice really makes a huge difference. Um, we do have a question, so I want to let's let's get like a question from one of the 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 um, attendees. Is it Naya? Uh, it's Naya. Naya. Okay. Why don't you ask your question? Okay, sure. Introduce yourself and your major, and then ask your question. Oh yeah, I'm Naya, and I'm an accounting major here at UConn. And my question was about more so for like accounting and finance interns and when you're working on projects i was just wondering what type of relationship the interns kind of get with those that they're working with so is it like a lot of feedback and like constantly you're getting like your work checked on and sometimes i know companies will do like mentors that they get when they're working on internships so i was just curious what that relationship is like when you have an intern like an internship at otis yeah definitely so i would say all of the above so during a su typical summer internship of 12 weeks, you have two official performance evaluations, one at the midpoint and one at the end of the summer by your direct manager. Basically what happens is first you'll go in and do like a little self-assessment. It's nothing crazy. It's just kind of like how, how you think the summer went, where areas where you think you need to improve, and then your manager will go in and they will make comments as well. So that is done twice per summer at a bare minimum. And then of course, on top of that, we encourage our managers, you know, very, much more regularly to have more informal type of feedback with our interns. Um, we hire freshmen as interns that have never had a job in their entire lives. Um, and so the feedback is really, really important. And I think that that only helps you, you know, you as the intern get better um, because sometimes you don't know what you're doing wrong until someone tells you, right? And this is at any point in your career. I, again, I've worked in HR for a really long time and, you know, people have been terminated, fired, and they say, I, my man, I never knew that things were going wrong. And then you dig back in and the manager never provided them that feedback. And so it's unfortunate, right? Because you think about how many of those situations could have been avoided if they had had more regular feedback. So all of that is to say, you know, two formal evaluations, and then we encourage managers, you know, no timing, right? And we don't say like weekly or daily, but just, you know, constant feedback. And then personally, me as the program manager, I formally meet with the every intern that we have at the company, um, at least twice per, you know, per, um, internship once in the midpoint ish. Um, and then once towards the end to see how things are going, see how, if there's anything that I can do on my end to improve upon things. Um, and then outside of that, you know, interns are always encouraged to put time on my calendar. Again, sometimes it's easier to talk to someone that's more like neutral and partial if things aren't going, you know, sublimely with their manager or with their team. So, that's just kind of on the, the the basics. And then yes, to your to your point before, every intern is also given um, a buddy, which is similar to what you said about a mentor, someone a little bit more early career, someone who's not their direct manager that they can also go to and they get feedback from as well. So I personally think it's very well-rounded. You're constantly um, getting feedback in a, a positive, productive way. And also you have a lot of different resources to be able to go to depending on, you know, how you're feeling about things, right? If things are not going well with your manager, you know, you have me to go to say, you didn't like me, you'd have your manager to go to. So it's very well-rounded and it's not just um, restricted to being, you know, that feedback back and forth with one person. You have a lot of different resources to go to. be a good time to take a little bit of a pivot here because because you have that unique role of actually meeting with everybody who works through the internships are there some common areas that you see people struggle with that you feel like it, it's an easy fix like for me to say you know there there's there's a few things that if you think about before you go into the internship for those first 30 days that could make life easier make them more effective yeah i think oftentimes people are scared to ask questions. A lot of people 
feel like if they're asking too many questions, it makes me seem like I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Because I'm not just like getting it up front. Um, and then what happens? You don't ask questions. You're not really understanding properly. Time is passing. Now the manager is frustrated because you're not working at the level that they expect. And so, you know, and then I start meeting with the interns and, you know, they're describing this and I'm like, well, did you, did you ask questions? Did you get clarification? And normally if that, if the situation has gotten to that point, the answer is probably no. And so my recommendation is always ask a ton of questions. I'm 37 years old. If I was starting a new job today, I would be asking every question under the sun. I don't care what it makes me look like. I want to understand what my expectations are and what I need to do to be successful in the role. So I'm going to ask every question that comes into my brain because I want to be able to do it right the first time without it getting to that place. And so I think a lot of people um, really miss that and are scared to, to be so upfront with those questions because they don't want to seem like they don't know what they're doing. And oftentimes that is a very, very easy fix um, to be able to improve upon, you know, your, your quality of work or whatever the situation might be. Yeah, I, I think that's really helpful because like you said, if you're having the conversation and the person's on the way out the door, it's too late to be able to do much to fix it. And an internship is as much a learning curve for any, whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate freshman, or you know, it's your junior internship, it's, it's learning what it's like to work with others, communications, work on teams, as much as it is learning about the company. So that Absolutely. makes, yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. That's, so that's, many, so many that. students will ask me at a career fair during the interview process, like, what do I need to know coming in? And the answer is often, you don't need to know anything. Just mm -hmm. come in, you know, you will learn. We our whole, our whole mission and goals are really to give you the tools that you need to succeed um, by the end of the summer. Because again, you know, this internship is to your point, Kathy, as much of a learning experience than just a job, mm -hmm. right? You can go right. and get a job anywhere. You know, we want you to come out of the summer feeling like, you know, if you are a finance intern that you know exactly what the expectation would be if you were, you know, an entry level finance employee at the company, um, because all of the work that you'd be doing, say, as a finance intern would be work that anyone in the finance department would be doing. Um, we don't save like our busy work, like, oh, let's save it for the intern. Anything that you're working on is something that the team would be working on if you weren't there. Um, and so the whole goal is to give you that experience. And, you know, so you can say, oh, I thought I wanted to be a accounting intern. I hate accounting. I don't really want to do, be an accounting intern, right? Like the whole goal is to really be able to help you find out what you want to do as your career. Mm -hmm. oh, that's that's great advice. Um, I want to just be cognizant of time. I know we've got quite a few students on the line here. Is there anybody who wants to raise their hand or put a question in the chat? And remember that our goal here is to have you walk away from this session knowing more about how to be your best self and a strong candidate for um, for Otis, although Jacqueline's given great advice really for kind of any interview that you're uh, that you're interviewing for. So Judy, do you see any hands raised? Because I can keep going all day long. I don't think I do, but if there is one, just um, put your video on and speak out. Um, be my guest. Okay. So um, I'll, yeah. I'll let. Yeah. I put, I put it, uh, something in chat myself. So. Oh. Um, so Jacqueline, what I wanted to know is, do you do higher view first or is there a phone screen first or is higher view your screen? Like higher, what's the higher order? view will typically be in place of a phone screen. Okay. So if we've met you at a career fair, like if we went to Expo, I met with you, I put a star on your resume, we would probably bypass the higher view and go straight to interview if I recommended you. If you were just someone who applied organically, we'd never spoken to you, we don't know anything about you, we would then typically go with the higher view just to have some knowledge about you before we get to the interview stage. And the reason we do that is the quantity of applications that we get is pretty high. And so, you know, in order to decide on 
you know, who's best fit to interview. Again, the resume is one thing, but that doesn't always tell the picture, right? So there might be, you know, 20 good resumes. We'll have them all do um, the higher view if we didn't meet them in person. And then, you know, from there assess, okay, we want these five people to actually, you know, face-to-face -face interview. Great, thanks. Um, and just a reminder, we would love for you to ask questions, but um, since our time will be running out soon, um, just a reminder that um, any of your career centers or career advisors are happy to do practice interviews with you. And we can do it virtually or we can do it in person. And then in a very comfortable um, space, give you some feedback. So, you know, we know that for some of you, this is new and, if, you know, you might be nervous. So please use the resource that we're giving you um, and schedule a practice interview so that we can um, make you feel more confident so that by the time you get to Otis, you will, um, you know, be more prepared. Right. Um, so any questions? So Jacqueline, I do have one question. So are, do you have super days? Yes, some of our teams, our sales teams do do super days. Okay. And can you just kind of walk us through the process for that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, I mean, it's really just more of an interview. So um, our one of our regions right now is doing actually doing a super day today in Chicago. And so typically it'll maybe be like a half day event where you'll come in with other candidates um, at the same time. Typically, there will be a couple of round of interviews, but then there also might be some different interactions with, you know, members of the team as well. And that's really to, you know, be able to assess in a non interview type of environment. How do you interact with people where you can see as well, you know, are these people I want to work with are these people that I, you know, get along with. And so typically we'll do those just for our full time entry level hires internships. Not so much. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and the super day, the long interviews like that, it, it's important to stay energized during those. So Jacqueline, you talked about showing that passive passion and energy harder to do that when it's across like a four or five hour period. Yeah. So hydrate, take a break, sneak an energy bar. Yeah. 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 And again, you know, those will differ. Sometimes they even do um, like a fun activity. Like, a, I don't think this year they are, but a couple of years ago, they took them bowling at the end of the day. So it can really differ. And so if you're interviewing with a company that's, you know, telling you about a super day, it could mean a ton of different things. So kind of be prepared, prepared for everything, right. <laughs> for anything. Yeah. And that bowling experience is very much a part of the interview <laughs> as the rest of the day. How do you it, interact with others? Do you play nice in the sandbox? Totally, yeah. totally. Right. Okay. Well, Jacqueline, I, I appreciate every time that you come to campus and every time you share yourself, your insight into the company. And this, as, as you know, we host this on the YouTube channel. So for those who are watching it at a later point in time and don't have the benefit of being able to ask you a question, is there a way that they can find out more information about the interview process? Just review the website. What do yeah. you they should do for prep? Go to our website, of course. Hopefully my name is posted somewhere here. You can reach out to me. Yeah. My name is very unique. If you type my name in on LinkedIn, I'm the only person that will come up in the whole world. Um, feel free to reach out. Same as Judy said, I, even if you're not interviewing, I love reviewing resumes. I love talking mm -hmm. to students or just, candidates in general. So if you ever just want an employer to look over your resume and get that point of view from the employer side, I am more than happy to. So please don't hesitate to reach out. That, that's absolutely wonderful. So last round, any questions that anybody thought of while we were talking? And it's one of those things where it's usually once you disconnect, that's when the questions pop into your head. Right. And so we gave Jacqueline's email right at the beginning, Kathy. So if anybody um, would like to contact Jacqueline individually with a question or as Kathy said, when they think about it afterwards, um, her email is right at the beginning of the chat. Okay. okay. I just put it back in there again. Just with the one caveat, for those who see that Jacqueline has offered her email, 
please be mindful of her time and have your questions be very concise and very focused. And Jacqueline, I thank you as always. Thank you for doing this all the way from Arizona when you were working on um, the recruiting all across the country. So we appreciate you very much for all that you do. And no, for all the students that were on here, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. You're appreciate welcome. it. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Kathy. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. -bye.